Welcome to Dubs Talk. I am Dalton Johnson, joined by Monty Poole. And Warriors fans, remember to visit Mancini's Sleep World for up to $900 in 4th of July savings. Monty, we are here because free agency is off to a wild start, especially in the Western Conference. We already knew the Bradley Beal trade to the Suns was going to be a blockbuster. But then Fred Van Vliet with three years, $130 million to the Rockets, who seem to be trying to get this young core up and running right now. Kyrie Irving staying in Dallas. So we're going to get a longer look at the Luka Kyrie mix with Kyrie staying on a three-year deal. We'll get into all of that. But we are here for really one reason and one reason only. Draymond Green returning to the Warriors with you confirming that it's a four-year, $100 million deal with the fourth year being a player option. Right away, I just want to know, did anything surprise you today when it came down to the Draymond news? Uh, not really. I, I think the fourth year a little bit, but it's a player option. Uh, <clears throat> I always knew, based on everything I'd heard, that it was going to be at least three years. So I thought maybe it'll be three years, $90 million or something like that. But uh, he the fourth year is something obviously he wanted player option, but the three years puts him in line with Steph Curry's contract, you know? And so, um, so as a surprise, I would say not really. I think we knew that he wasn't going to make a ton more money than he made last. I mean, he was going to make 27, six this year, if he had not opted out. And I think we knew that on the long haul, if he got a four year deal, for example, he wasn't going to make that on the average per year. He's going to take a cut of some kind, but it looks like in the first year, he's between 22 and 23 million a year which is less than he made last season. But over the course of the contract, it's still penciled out to $100 million. So I think for Draymond, <clears throat> what this does is, A, it aligns him with Steph for three more years at least, at least one more year with Clay. And I think we'll get to Clay's situation a little bit later. But, but also, it gives the Warriors a savings on their exorbitant tax bill. You know, I mean, if he had gone for the full, if he had gone for a full 25 or 30 million for the first year, boom, 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 that's going to be another 15, 20, 30 million dollars. So as it is, you know, he could save them between 40 and 50 million dollars in the first year. So if you're the Warriors, you're like, OK, you know, it's it's a little bit of a discount, but it's, it's a, for, for Draymond, but it's a huge discount for the Warriors because, I mean, 40, 50 million dollars is nothing to scoff at. So. Um, I, I think in the long haul that, that this was the right move. Obviously, everything was trending this way. Draymond had the leverage. But also, before long, that leverage began to diminish because where else was he going to go? You know, yeah, where, where I think options were there. The Warriors, they were always the best fit. It was, it was a marriage that had to continue for both sides in my eyes. They benefit each other very much. I, I think the only thing that really surprised me at first was that fourth year because I was – always expecting three years just to be in line with Steph Curry. I thought, okay, three years. We heard Steph Curry at the match yelling, three more years to Draymond, right? So that's what I saw. thought was going to be in line with whatever Steph Curry has as far as on his contract is what Draymond Green was going to go for for the years. The fourth year, again, kind of surprised me at first, but then you're talking about the tax purposes and Mike Dunleavy Jr. is up to a pretty good start in his new role as Warriors GM, being able to bring in Chris Paul, being able to save money in these, these kind of moves when it comes to Patrick Baldwin Jr. going to, going to the Wizards, Draymond Green with that fourth year and, and kind of backloading it, right? So that's where, again, Mike Dunleavy Jr. off to a pretty strong start as the Warriors' new GM. Yeah, if you're a Warriors fan, you got to like this because this is in line with what they've been doing for the last – I'm going to say four and a half, five months. It began when they traded out James Wiseman uh, and they brought in Gary Payton the second. So you trade out Wiseman, who's 21 years old at the time or 22 years old now, and you bring in GP two, who is 30 years old. And then last week, of course, they trade out Jordan Poole at 24 years old. And they bring in Chris Paul at 38 years old. They also trade away Patrick Baldwin Jr. Who was, I think 20 is even 20 yet 21. Uh, and so, and Ryan Rollins, also two guys that are both 20, 21 years old. So it was pretty clear beginning in February and everything they've done since then that they was all about buying into this year. This year was the big investment. Chris Paul, one year fully guaranteed, year two partially guaranteed. So this is about what they can do this year. And bringing Draymond in sort of completes that part of the puzzle. 
the starting lineup is back intact. And uh, it was the, the best starting lineup in the NBA last season. You know, so uh, there is that. Now, the question, there are some questions, though. You know, the average age of that starting lineup is going to be almost 32 years old when the season starts. Um, and all those guys will have to be managed to some degree, except maybe Wiggins, you know, and whether it's Clay, Steph, Draymond, and Loon, you know, these, I mean, I don't, I don't want to see Loon go another 82 game season. I agree. Uh, yeah. I, I just think it's not the best for his long-term outlook, you know, give this guy a rest every now and then, but having Draymond back gives them that, okay, that urgency. Now you got Draymond, Steph wanted him back, Clay wanted him back. And so, um, I think if you're a Warriors fan, you've got to like that. And also there is the, I guess, the romantic side of it that says these three guys, man, they've been together the entire time. And you just don't see that anymore. I mean, the Spurs had that with Duncan and, and Parker and Ginobili. Uh, but, but in today's NBA, so much has changed in the last five, six, seven years. And you just don't see guys stay together with one team for a long time. Guys move, guys move, guys move. And for a team that has had the kind of success the Warriors have had and to keep their core intact. It says a lot about the three guys, first of all, but also says about what CEO Joe Lacob and his guys are willing to do to keep that thing going. You know, last yeah. year, got a little, last summer was a little weird because you're like, okay, we're going to go two timeline, yada, yada, yada. But it's pretty clear now. They're like, you know what? Let's ride this thing until the wheels fall off. And hopefully when the wheels fall off, we'll have a plan to be able to put back into a position, a team that can be a contender. Man, I'm, I'm happy that you brought up the romantic side of it. I know that sometimes we can't do that as media members. We got to put our head down and be straightforward. But the emotionality that does matter. You know, I, I don't want to see Allen Iverson in a Grizzlies jersey. I don't want to see Patrick Ewing in a, in a Sonics jersey, Michael Jordan in a Wizards jersey. So uh, number one, already looked would have looked weird enough with whatever jersey Draymond Green could have been wearing. But then it's about the big three. You know, sure, there's there's a lot of big threes in the NBA now that are formed, that, that, are, that are picked, that are brought in, that are traded for, that are signed. This is different. This is homegrown. This is how it's, quote, unquote, supposed to be. You know, and, and some of these new rules are made almost to take that away from the Warriors but they're finding a way to keep that big three together, an all-time trio. And there's something about that that I'm still going to have a little bit of that just sports fandom in general. I'm not going to yes. say Warriors fan. I'm saying sports fandom at the core of our hearts where you go, you know what? Pretty cool to see. If they can ride out right out to the sunset together, awesome. If it doesn't happen because there, there's still some missing – there's still some ingredients you got to figure out down the road when it comes to clay – and all of that, we'll figure that out. But right now, it looks like they've made it clear to the Warriors, we want us to be together. The Warriors have said, you know what? Handshake, we got you. These are our guys, and we're going to keep riding with them. Yeah. And now, we with those three guys together, <clears throat> there's also this element, too. And it began, actually, with Andrew Wiggins last year. Andrew Wiggins took a hometown discount. Mm. You know, he, could, you know he, he, he took less money to stay with the Warriors. And now Draymond Green takes, you know, less money again, less money than he could have made probably, could have could have pushed for more. So when Klay Thompson's turn comes, the precedent is set. You know, I mean, Clay is not in position right now to ask for a max deal. You know, certainly not a super max because, you know, there are certain parameters you gotta, you gotta hit. But if Clay Thompson, uh, when he comes up, uh, you know, it'd be hard for him to say, I want $45 million, <laughs> you know, when Draymond just took 22 and 22, $23 million in year one. So I think if you're Clay, who admitted at the time that he got his last contract that, you know, it, it just, it shocked, but it, it really kind of, it, he was overjoyed with the fact that the Warriors were giving him a max deal, knowing that he wouldn't play for a year or two, you know, and, and they, they did it anyway. They stayed with it, which, their credit around the league was like, whoa, okay, the Warriors, you know, they're they're serious about this. They take care of their guys. And Clay even said at the time, he says, who does that? You know, well, the Warriors did it. So I think that solid will probably come back to Clay. And at some point he'll say, you know what? Yeah, I mean, I want to stay my career here, keep my rest of my career here. And, you know, I won't be looking for another, you know, four years and $140 million or anything like that. Maybe 
you know, he'll take something less. So I'm curious to see how that plays out when the time comes. But you got another year to go right now with these three guys on the same con on the same timeline together um, with Loon and, and Wiggins in the starting lineup. So I think if you're a Warriors fan, you got to like where the team is right now because, again, you kept those three guys together. And you're giving, this is like, okay, you know what? We're going to go all in on this season. And whatever happens after that, we'll adjust. Yeah, I think Clay famously said when Kevin Durant got here, I'm not sacrificing blank. And but at this point in his career, you know, he's he's going to have to sacrifice a little bit going forward. And that's okay. I think Steph Curry always kind of is the example for when it comes to sacrifice, when it comes to leading the way. And then to see Draymond Green, what he did with this contract plays up next. So I think it'll be great for him to kind of see those two kind of guys, see Draymond lay down the precedent and go, why would I want to go anywhere else? Why would you want to go anywhere else? These are my guys. Let's do this the right way. And if it means a little bit less money, then so be it. The rings are what matter matters to these guys. It matters right now in this window. And the only window that really matters is the next three years, but it's year by year. It's not looking at 2026, 2025, or even 2024. It's 2023 and the 2024 season, right? Of course, it has to be a year-by-year -year thing with them. But it's a three-year window, maybe a four-year too with Draymond in that fourth-year option. But the window is Steph Curry's window. He's the one that just kind of decides how long this dynasty goes for. But keeping... Draymond, having him on board, it just keeps the train on tracks. So whether that might be a few bumps in the road here and there, understandable, but he keeps the train going. Yeah, my, that's my question to you is, okay, now, <clears throat> as you mentioned earlier, you know, you got, they're going to be nearly 32 years old when the season starts. Do you think the Steph, Dre, Clay core can still be the, the, the root of a Warriors championship season? I think so. I think that a lot of this also hangs on other guys as well, and, and very much so Andrew Wiggins, because we look at what happened last year, and Andrew Wiggins is coming off of you know this really breakout season, this all-star season with the Warriors, showing what a two-way player he can be in the playoffs, especially the NBA Finals. And look, he missed two months to tend to a family matter. I am not going to fault somebody for that. You know, and then there were so many different wrinkles within that season, but I think we look back now and we go, Andrew Wiggins missed two months. That's a big deal. And he was solid, but up and down in the playoffs when he came back. Good, not great. You get a full season of him. You get year three in Moody and Kaminga, which is really, really the year that you make the leap, you know, and, and I think that the Warriors feel like they're ready. And if they're not, then they're going to pack it up and move on. Because again, like I said, it's a year by year thing, right? So I still think it starts and stops and ends with those big three. But I think Andrew Wiggins holds a major key going forward as someone who is in his mid to later 20s and can kind of bridge the gap and keep this thing going. You get a full season of him now. You get a full season of those four together, of the five together with Kavon Looney, you know, we think, fingers crossed, a full season. So that's a big thing. I think that we got to kind of sit back and remember, Andrew Wiggins missing two months was a big deal. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think this Warriors team, you know, again, there's still moves to be made as the summer goes on uh, beyond Draymond. But I, I think they still this team can be one that, that puts together a top four finish in the West. Yeah. Won't be easy. It won't no. be easy. You know, Denver... Obviously, the defending champion, but Bruce Brown is on his way out, and Bruce Brown was huge for that team, huge for that team, you know. And now you got the Suns now with with Bradley Beal joining up with uh, Devin Booker and Kevin Durant. That's as good a trio as you're going to find in anybody's league anywhere. I mean, those guys are all ballers, and so the question is, what can they put around that? They're putting in some. They've got pieces coming in. D. Lee is going to be back with the Suns next season. Uh, Watanabe from Brooklyn comes over, you know, so. Um, they got Keita Bates, Bates Diop and, and, and Josh Okoge. So you've got guys, I think with them, it's going to be the key for them is going to be what can they get out of, out of DeAndre Ayton. If DeAndre Ayton play, puts together a good season, the Suns could be monstrous. You know, oh, my so, gosh, yeah. Yeah, if, if that happens. Now, they won't be very deep. But <clears throat> with those four guys, if DeAndre Ayton plays at, I won't even say all-star level, if he just plays 
at a consistently decent level, 18 and nine. Um, I, I think, yeah, I think that team is, is, can be, can be frightening as long as they can keep KD healthy. You know, he's at the age now where, you know, he's probably going to miss some games. He's missed games each year. Um, but you know, when he's out there, we know he's a warrior. So lowercase. <laughs> so, um, but you look at that Kyrie Irving, Dallas, you know, Kyrie Luca, what you think? Yeah, I think I, I'm way higher on the Suns right now than I am on the Mavs, just because yeah. Kyrie Luca, it was a, it was such a short sample size that we saw last season, and it was it didn't work great. But they also were dealing with injuries. There was times when there wasn't a lot of time when the two of them were on the court together. Number one, but I still need to see it work offensively and defensively, and see what they're going to build around the two of them because it's not about just two players anymore. It has to really be three or more, it feels like, at times. And the Suns feel like they have four players that they can build around with DeAndre Ayton being the number four as a former number one overall pick. Pretty good number four right there. So I do believe that DeAndre Ayton is the one that holds the key because that Suns team is going to put up points. And they went from being top-heavy, and they still are going to be top-heavy. But today, the first day of free agency, I thought that they were a pretty big winner, to be honest with you, because they brought – some good complimentary pieces around those four players that are going to help them out. It's going to come down to the defense though for, for that Phoenix Suns team. If they can hold their own, stay healthy and play a little bit of defense because they're going to, again, like I said, they're going to put up some big time numbers, but it might be some 136 to 143 type <laughs> games when you're playing the Phoenix Suns. Yeah, no question about it. I mean, the West is going to be wild. You look, even the Lakers, I mean. Yeah, <clears throat> I like their moves too. Yeah, they re-signed Rui Hachimura, you know, three years. Uh, they bring in Gabe Vincent from the, the Heat. And Gabe Vincent is a nice little player. He's a oh, nice little player. Oh, good move for sure. Yeah. Good for you know. him, my gosh. No, number one, a former Stockton Kings guy who's going out and getting a $33 million contract. It's just stuff like that that you really do like to see, whether it's Fred Van Vliet, former undrafted, or Gabe Ooh. Vincent, what he's doing. Really cool to see on, on a day like this because – we're going to talk about the big names, but for a Gabe Vincent to do that and be able to either see himself as a, in a starting role for the Lakers or a really important backup role for a Lakers who they're another team that uh, if you have LeBron James there, you got Anthony Davis there, you're going to have to have championship ex uh, aspirations in LA as well. Yeah. And then, I mean, I think the same, the same still applies for the Clippers, you know, although they're in a little bit of flux here, what you know? What's going to happen with Kawhi? What's going to happen with PG? Westbrook obviously belongs there. He, you know, he should stay right there and and just do his thing there. That's you know that appears to be a good spot for him. Um, and and we know that Steve Ballmer, the uh, the big guy in, in with the Clippers, you know he he won't be shy about spending money that it takes to compete. So I think the Clippers will be in the mix somewhere if they again if they stay healthy. You got young teams like OKC coming along. You know, we don't know where Memphis is going to go. We know Memphis is pretty good, but Josh is going to miss a – Josh. Ja is going to miss a bunch of the season. And I think Dylan Brooks' departure, I think, is is like addition by subtraction. Right. <laughs> I think they're a better team. They'll be a better team with him gone. So I like what they did. Marcus Smart's going to be good for that team, I think. And so um, the West, man, I mean – the Warriors like where they are if they stay healthy, and Rick, Dr. Rick Celebrini is going to have a ton of work. His staff are going to be busy. Um, <laughs> but, but if you're the Warriors, you're thinking if, if we're healthy, we'll be we like our chances. You know, against all these teams, Phoenix could be an issue, and so could Denver. We'll see how Denver fit, flushes out because Bruce Brown, that's a huge loss, man. I mean, that's not a very deep team. Uh, and maybe they're probably thinking, okay, we, we can find another Bruce Brown, but there aren't really many guys like that. You know, he's, he's in that Draymond Gary Payton, the second kind of thing where he's kind of a guy who does a little bit of everything that helps you win games. And he's a guy who's not really a guard, not really a forward, not really a center. He's just a basketball player. And, and so, uh, I think his, his departure is going to hurt them. So I'm not going to say the race is wide open, but I am going to say that the Warriors, if they're healthy, they have a chance to, to get in there. But obviously, they will need to make some more moves. Yeah, I think the West, yeah, again, I don't know if it's wide open, but to see what it's going to look like after one month compared to three months compared to the end of the season, that's what I'm really going to be interested in because I think there's going to be a lot of 
moving parts. And, and if teams get cold, they can get hot later because there's a lot of talent out here, you know. So for the Warriors, it is going to come down to health, no doubt about that, um, especially with Chris Paul, especially with Draymond Green, especially with Steph and Clay. Those four guys, they need to be able to stay healthy. You just brought up Gary Payton the second. I just I, I was just talking about having a full season of Andrew Wiggins. A full season of Gary Payton the second is what, of course, they expect and want compared to seven games of him plus the playoffs. So <clears throat> this last season, looking back at it now, was it's just so weird. Number one, right? I mean, that's as simple as terms I could say it. It was a weird, weird season. And now you're going to get a team that I think that they see as more complete right now because there are some yeah. missing pieces. And that kind of brings me to the next part is that Mike Dunleavy Jr. has pretty much said that they're going to leave that 15th roster spot open as they've done in the past. With Draymond, you now have 11 guys on the roster. So that leaves a few spaces left. What is the main objective that you see next on the board for the Warriors? Well, they, they want to get more shooting. Uh, and they, they'd like to get a, a big shooter. You know, uh, they also want to get someone. I think there's a reason why Ty Jerome is still on their radar. Yes. You know, yeah. And, and so, I mean, again, with Chris Paul being your backup, you, you might need a, a backup to Chris Paul, <laughs> you know, so um, just because of, again, you're going to try and nurture him through the season, get him through 60 or so games at 15, 20 minutes a night. Uh, but again, you want to make sure that you're safe there. So you can't just say, okay, Steph and CP3, we're going to roll with you guys. You got to have a, a safety back there. Somebody who, you know, you can, you can turn to in case either one of those guys goes down, you know, uh, I just nightmare scenario, obviously, is that Steph misses a bunch of games and then you got to rely on Chris Paul to maybe start. And that's that's going to throw thing, change things quite a bit. So I definitely think that uh, another, another point guard, whether it's Ty Jerome or someone else, will be in the mix, too. But I think, you, you know, I, I go back to Bob Myers. I was saying you can never have too much shooting. You can never have too much shooting. So, you know, we've talked about one guy. Uh, Dario Saric is a guy who um, the Warriors looked at are still looking at as of right now but we believe that it will happen and dario you tell me what do you think dario why do you think the warriors would even be interested in the guy like dario Saric? because he checks multiple boxes we just talked about two things size and shooting right there that's what dario Saric will be able to bring yeah, if he does wind up on the Warriors, both of let's us assume he will. Yeah, that the way yeah that the Warriors are very high on the uh, on Dario Saric, that there's a very high probability that he winds up in the Bay Area. This could happen very soon in free agency. This is someone who's 29 years old, not someone who's 39. So that kind of adds to it as well, where he's not in it. You know, he's not a guy who's 20, 21, a rookie that you're, not, that you're trying to have the groom, but someone who's been there before. But you shouldn't have to worry too much about an injury risk. But six foot ten, who shot over thirty nine percent from three point range last year, plays with a little bit of edge, has some playmaking ability in his game. As someone who's going to shoot the ball and pass the ball, isn't going to be someone who's going to hold on to the ball and make the offense stuck. I think he keeps the flow of the, of the offense moving along. A former top pick as well, so I, I think Dario Sarge is just a, somebody who checks multiple boxes for the Warriors and, and a guy that I think Mike Dunleavy Jr. can go and say. We get Draymond, Chris Paul, Dario Sarge. After that, kind of fill in the blanks. That's a really, really good start to rounding out a, a, a full lineup that you need going forward. Yeah, I, I think Dario Sarge, um, it, it, it seems to me that the Warriors are going in on guys that fit the uh, high IQ profile. Yes. Uh, and, and that's something that obviously the last couple of years, you know, they didn't always have that. You know, they didn't always have that. But – when you look back to their their best seasons, they always had that. They always had really smart guys on the court. Feel for the game was there every single yeah. year. Yeah, I mean, I, and obviously Chris Paul fits that profile. You know, the guys they drafted seem to fit that profile. You know, you got Jackson Davis, who is a kid who you know the, the son of a basketball NBA basketball player. You know, Pajemski is a guy who is a you know quote unquote gym rat, a guy who loves the game and really kind of lives for the game. And now so. You got those two guys. And Dario Saric also fits that profile. He comes from that European ethos where guys learn the fundamentals early and they apply them on a regular basis and they don't take anything for granted. You know, and so Dario Saric, like 
He plays hard. He plays smart. He passes. He shoots it. Uh, I think uh, for the Warriors, Dario Saric would be a guy, he, you know, he's going to follow in line Otto Porter Jr., Jermichael Green, Dario Saric. I mean, that's that's the that's the role. Otto Porter Jr. excelled in it. They had to nurture him through the season, but they did, and it worked. It paid off. They won a championship. So Michael Green was up and down, in and out of the lineup, in and out of the rotation, uh, and so it didn't work as well as they had hoped. Dario Saric has, is a more complete player offensively than either of those guys. I mean, Otto can really shoot it, but neither Otto nor Jermichael is going to pass like Dario. Uh, and so it's, it's like I, I think there's an upside there with Dario Saric on this roster that the Warriors, are, I mean, that's, that's why he's high on their board, and that's why they looked at him and said, okay, let's go after that guy. The Otto Porter Jr. mold is what the Warriors probably missed the most this season. Jamichael Green was supposed to fit it, and it didn't fully complete what the Warriors were looking for. You know, I, he didn't shoot the ball like, like they were hoping for. He had little spurts, but the consistency just wasn't there. And I think Dario Sarge, he would be more of that well-rounded player that we saw in Otto Porter Jr. Maybe Otto Porter Jr. adds a little bit more rebounding, but Sarge yeah. adds some more passing. And they're both three-point threats. And also, Sarge can play more of the five than Otto Porter Jr. even could have. So Otto Porter Jr. was more of a stretch four. When Dario Sarge was in uh, Oklahoma City, he was primarily a five. The mm -hmm. season before with Phoenix, primarily a five. He can do the four or the five. And that's exactly. why I talk about someone who's versatile and checks multiple boxes. You're not going to just put him in a box, in a single one, and say, this is the one thing that you do. I think Dario Sarge can, can do a handful of different things. And he fits. I, I just feel like what Steve Kerr looks for, high IQ, keep the ball moving, stretch the floor, and don't get in the way. <laughs> yeah. You know, and one more thing before we go. I mean, the, the high IQ uh, approach that the Warriors are taking, and, and I don't mean this dump on the guy, but, but there were times last year when Jordan Poole was so lost, it was clear he wasn't thinking straight. Right. You know? Some of the shots he took, some of the some of the decisions he made on the court were very puzzling and just didn't fit the profile. I was like, what is he doing out there? That's not a smart play. That's not a smart move. Uh, what is he thinking? Is he thinking? And so I think you lose a dynamic player in Jordan, but I think you don't you lose a guy that you over the last season, you couldn't trust him on the floor. You know, you couldn't trust him to make the right the right decision on the floor. And when you have a guy who has the ball as much as he did and you can't trust his decision-making, you got issues. So <clears throat> I, I think as the, as the summer moves on, as free agency moves on, I expect the Warriors to collect a few more guys that kind of fit that mold, the guys that are not necessarily safe picks, but guys that understand what the Warriors want to do, understand their, that, that, are, that fit their style of play, and bring that intelligent basketball to the, to the, uh, to the gym. Even if, the, if there's players – their ceiling might not be sky high, but I think the Warriors are going to get guys whose floor is very, very high, where, it's, again, the trust factor. And I think that's huge for Steve Kerr. You even look at – you brought up Trace Jackson Davis. He played 126 college games. That matters, especially as a big man in Steve Kerr's system, someone who had four assists per game as a senior. So all these little things – they they combine that they, they compound they, they matter for the Warriors and it just takes me back to certain players whether it's a Sean Livingston a David West a Leandro Barbosa guys that you never really had to go what what was that decision and <laughs> that's what I think that the Warriors are doing with Chris Paul with Draymond Green and why they have their eyes and why they believe that they can maybe get a Dario Sarch as well is because that works for them they are Warriors type of players yeah yeah, I, I, there are two questions. I have, well, three. I mean, I mentioned one question I have about the Warriors, and that is the health slash age. Right. The, the other two is length and quickness. Um, they weren't really a long team last year. And, you know, obviously Sarge adds, adds some length, but they need more, I think. They need, they need I think, one more long body out there. And I, and I do wonder, I mean, Chris Paul is not a quick guy anymore. No. I mean, he never – yeah, he, he, you know, he, he was pretty quick when he came into the league, but he's never really been a go, go guy. And now he's certainly at 38. He's certainly not that guy. So, uh, but I think his change of pace will be fine. Sean Livingston wasn't a quick guy either. You know, he was a guy who used his length, but 
I think as the, as the summer goes, they got to be on the lookout for guys that have length and guys that have an element of quickness, that have a little bit of speed because when the worst were at their best, again, yeah, they were smart, but they were lightning fast. I mean, all those death lineups were, were quick lineups. I mean, they moved like lightning. And so uh, I don't expect this team to be able to recreate that. They're too advanced in age now. But I do expect them to be able to look at guys who can give them a jolt of speed. And that will certainly help when you face guys like John ja Morant, you know, guys like 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 Murray and, and Denver, you know, even when you when you face the Suns with Paul and with with um, I'm not Paul, but with Booker and Beal in the backcourt, you know. So these are all things that are on their plate, and we'll see how it plays out over the next uh, few days and the next maybe even the next couple of weeks. Yeah, with the age concern, you of course think about athleticism, you know, and, and that's again where it comes down so much to me with Jonathan Kaminga where as far as his evolution goes, starting with it being simple and running the floor and, and why I think Chris Paul could be so big for him. The Warriors need some some change-ups in, uh, on, on the offense when it comes to the pick and roll, when it comes to uh, having somebody like Jonathan Camino who can be so athletic and having Chris Paul, who's someone who has the ball in his hands more often, right? So I think Kaminga there is the guy that you just have to be able to have take the leap but it comes down to trust. It's the buzzword that I'm going to have the entire offseason because I think it's what is at the front of Steve Kerr's mind as well. Absolutely. You know, and and I think that's one of the things that last season um, really kind of got under the skin of the veterans. And, and that's why some of the lineups and some of the rotations got kind of weird because Steve wouldn't play certain guys because, you know, oh, Steve, you know, he's like, this guy's in Steve's doghouse. Well, maybe a little bit of that was true, but mostly it was about, the veterans saying, you know what, let's let's maybe not go that route, you know. And we'll say this about Steve Kerr. He listens to the vets. Yeah. He, he's done it all his entire time here. And so he listens to Draymond and Clay and Steph. And so if there's something that you don't like about the rotation, don't just look at Steve and his staff. <laughs> look at Steve and his staff and what the veteran players are putting in there because their input is always taken into consideration. Well, priority number one for the Warriors. Check it off the list. Draymond Green is remaining here in San Francisco. More moves are to be had, so I'm sure we'll be talking to you soon. Again, I'm Dalton. That was Monty. This was Dubs Talk. We'll be talking to you later.